the gear I took with me was 18 pounds. Um, and gone are the, uh, the big heavy hiking boots. Um, you wear running shoes or I, carry, I, I wore the, the small loas, the short loas, uh, hiking type shoes, but you know, two pounds total. But there were kids, there was one gentleman, uh, he hiked it in sandals. He was in sandals. He didn't have any blisters either, where the rest of us dealt with blisters. Um, then my wife was a big part of this. I, I don't think I could have completed the trail without it, uh, without her. Um, she came down a couple different times and would rent a car and then leapfrog me between either roads or campgrounds um, and you know, bringing things that I needed. Um, she actually developed um, a trail name and the hikers, it was funny, I, you know, I'd be hiking alone for a day or two until you know, like the next day Rose was supposed to be a, arriving and I was going to meet Rose. All of a sudden I had these hikers all around me. Well, she would give uh, hikers rides to town to get gear, um, you know, whatever, whatever they needed. She was kind of the go-between. And uh, um, you develop a trail name out there. You don't use your real name. And the hiker started giving her a name, and hers was St. Rose. <laughs> and one of, the, one of the best things she ever did is at, at one point she uh, was waiting for me, so she hiked in about a mile, mile and a half to a creek, and she put a six pack of Coca-Cola in the creek. And now this is on the Pacific Crest Trail, so nobody's gonna see it unless you're hiking on the Pacific Crest Trail. So when these hikers come through hot and dusty and dirty and they see a cold pop, it, it's like heaven. It's a slice of heaven. So um, she started doing that more and more because she, she was receiving these reviews. At one time, she had over $100 donated from hikers to buy more soda and just keep it in the creeks. Um, most people go south to north, 90% go south to north. Uh, you can start earlier in the year and it's, it's all just a function of the snow. If you go north to south, you can't start until, depending on the snow year, you can't start until late June or July. Then you end up in the desert in um, October, November, and there's a lot of support for us hikers in the desert, um, and a lot of that support goes away in the fall. It's there in the spring, but it's not there in the fall, so it's much tougher hike if you go north to south. Um, a lot of people slap out just under the stars or had tarps. Um, my feeling was that if I'm going to work that hard during the day, I'm going to sleep well at night and I'm not going to worry about anything crawling on me. So I carried a one-man tent and it was probably the heaviest piece of equipment I had, but I was going to make sure that I could sleep and not worry about anything. The one time, the one time I decided to lay out under the stars with a bunch of guys, um, just as I was rolling out my bag, I could see this great big line of black carpenter ants all over and said, I'm not doing it. I put my tent up and away we went. Okay, um, um, as I said, there's, there's a couple sections and Trudy has this wonderful map. I had it on my computer, but I, need, I needed uh, internet access to put it up. But um, Maybe we could pass it around to Trudy. But it just shows the uh, three states, California, Oregon, and Washington, and where the trail goes, um, and the regions that you go through. So we'll start with you, young lady. You can take a look at that. But don't miss a word that I say, OK? <laughs> uh, great guidebooks to do the trail. Um, I'd say they're indispensable, but I also say you don't need them. The trail is so well marked, but if you want to know what's coming up and you want to know where the water caches are, where the next creek or road crossing is, they're, they're fabulous. There's one for Southern California, Northern California, and one for Oregon and Washington. Um, I'll just start and then I'll keep going as I go through some of the photos here. One thing I would like you to watch as you uh, see these slides, watch the weight go down and the hair come up, okay? <laughs> so this is a southern terminus. This is, uh, this is Campo. This is the uh, monument in, in uh, California. That is the wall behind us. And so you turn around, you walk to the wall, touch it, turn around. And in my case, I was walking home, which was very comforting. A lot of people that hike the trail are from California. 
and in a short order they've passed their home and they're walking away from home. I was almost always walking home, which was a good feeling. It helped you stick with it. So th this is the desert. Um, this is, I heard there's a young lady from Kansas. I don't know if she see the chief hat there. Kansas City fan, so uh, that was, the chiefs took me, uh, took me on this trip. This is uh, saying goodbye to Rose. And that is the start of the trek uh, walking home. Um, the, deserts, the desert is extremely difficult. It's boring, it's hot. Um, you get up in the morning and you put your sunscreen on. You walk in the dusty trail and then you put more sunscreen on. You sweat and then you put your bug repellent on and then you put more sunscreen on. And then you climb in your bag at night. And you do that for like four days in a row before you can get to a shower or someplace to wash up. It's, um, it, it didn't take long that I had to sleep in, like um, I had a, uh, oh, uh, mid-weight um, Patagonia, that type of thing for pants and shirts because you would stick to your bag. You, you mean, it was awful. You couldn't roll over, the bag would come with you. So um, you had to sleep in something so you could sleep well. My, um, my favorite spot in the desert was uh, Mojave, California, the little town. It was just an awesome little town. It was an oasis. We actually crossed the um, uh, western arm of the Mojave Desert. Uh, and I've got a slide in there for that. The longest resupply or the longest, uh, uh, the mileage between water supplies was 35 miles. So there was a point where we had to, we slept you know, a day before we got to the next water supply. But there are people out there that, uh, see those jugs of water? There are people in the desert that, uh, that, that winter there and they will bring, uh, thank you, they'll bring water out. Uh, this is a small cache, and you're, not, you're told not to rely on any of them. We know where they're at, we know what miles that they're at, um, and the people do keep them resupplied, but you can't count on it because if something's wrong and there's no water there, you, you've got to be able to, to deal with it. But there'll be trail angels, exactly. There'll be a hundred gallons of water at a cache, and they're tied to a tree, so when you empty one, you tie it up so it doesn't blow away, and these people will resupply those all on their own fee, they, they buy the water and they haul it to wherever it's at. And you can't have them right at the road because who knows what could happen to them, so they have to be in a mile or so. Um, but, I mean, they're trail angels and they take care of you. Sometimes we would hike early in the morning, take a siesta, and then hike in the evening and into the night uh, just to stay uh, cool. In fact, um, that's the time where I saw the ants. Uh, we were hiking on the LA Aqueduct. Um, that's, it's not the official route now, they've moved it, but that's the traditional route. So that's, that's where um, you cross the desert at. Um, and we hiked into Mojave. And it is just a concrete slab in the ground with a road, dirt road next to it. And these stanchions that come up every so often, about every quarter mile, and before 9-11, you could open the hatch, lower your water jug in, and get water. Uh, but after 9-11, all those were welded shut, and you, you couldn't have access to that water. What time of year is this? This is uh, late April, maybe the 1st of May. And we had a very cool start this year, um, the year that I hiked. In fact, it rained us. The second day I hiked, I got rained on in the desert. Uh, it was cold and, uh, and somewhat cloudy, but it was great to get started that way. And I'll get that out of the way too. Out of uh, five months, it rained on me four days. That's all I had. You can't believe how many times you climb out of the tent in Southern California. God, the sun's out again. I can't believe it. What's well, wrong? Um, I went by myself. I went to hike by myself. I didn't have anybody else that was going on with me. I met this guy the first day. And my trail name was Samara. And I picked my name. And sometimes if you don't have a trail name, they'll give you one. And it usually has something to do with what you did wrong on the trail. Um, but I picked Samara. I have two daughters, Summer and Sarah, so I combined their names. 
and later found out that that's also the name for the whirly bird off the maple tree. Oh. And his, uh, his name was Ranger, and he was an army ranger, actually. And uh, we spent about 500 miles together. This is about 100 miles in. It's by Warner Springs, California. And it kind of gives you an idea. You saw the mountains and the sagebrush, and here's the grasslands. And this is in the same area. It's called Eagle Rock. The trail goes on the other side of the rock, but there's a sign telling you to go around the rock. And this wasn't sculpture. This is how the rock ended up. It's really cool. And this is, again, why you don't need the guidebook. You do, but you don't. Um, this is at the, uh, we've crossed San Jacinto. We're on the uh, valley floor by Palm Springs. The, right on the rock, it says which way the trail is. There's a water faucet that I've filled up my water bottle from, and that's coming right out of the, the tube that feeds Palm Springs. And the windmills there at, uh, um, at San Gorgio Pass, it's uh, the lowest point in Southern California. And you can see the straps in my backpack. I mean, that's how hard the wind's blowing. And we're just getting ready to cross under I-10, the highway, the freeway goes into Palm Springs. And this is about a week later. <laughs> it's like, for real? You know, really? Um, we're up in uh, the San Bernardinos, and you, you do that in the desert or in the, in the Southern California. You're on the desert floor, then you climb up into a mountain range, stay there for a day or two, then you go right back down the desert floor. Um, and so there's about four or five mountain ranges that we go through. What was the elevation range there? There, that's about 6,000 feet. And it was just a freak um, ice storm, snowstorm that came in. It caught everybody off guard. And the next slide shows all the hikers out of the woods at the pizza parlor in Wrightwood. It just pushed everybody <laughs> off the trail down into town. And uh, town was always special because it had hot water and a shower, a bed, beer, and pizza. That was, yeah, that's what you wanted when you went to town. This is, uh, we're on the flanks of uh, Mount Baden-Powell. Uh, those that you know, he's the founder of Boy Scouts. Um, the gentleman with me there, his name is Itsy Bitsy. <laughs> he's from Tennessee. That, uh, I don't know if you can tell by his legs, but he sewed his own, he's a one-piece nylon suit that he's wearing. Um, it didn't work out very well. Itsy Bitsy didn't last too long. We're, um, yeah, it just was, it didn't work out too well for him. Um, in fact, uh, you can't see, the, the hill's pretty steep there. He put his pack down and his suit, sleeping bag came off and rolled all the way down the hill and went quite a ways. We are sitting on a 1,500-year-old uh, pine tree. Uh, Limber Pine, I believe, is the name. There's actually a sign there uh, that talks about the tree. And then the next slide shows us at the monument on Baton Powell. Um, and then another shot of, you got the desert valley below you, it's probably 100 degrees down there and you've got uh, all this ice. This is two days after the storm. You watched where you put your tent because <laughs> you didn't want that falling on you in the middle of the night, but uh, huge pine cones. And that was a nice camp area, but those pine, pine cones put out so much pitch it was everywhere. It was hard not to uh, step in it or sit in it or... And this is uh, a group of hikers. We are on the road that uh, is crossing the Mojave. We had a 17 mile road walk, straight as an arrow. And it was so depressing because at the end of the road you'd see a car coming, you'd see the headlights. You knew they were traveling at 50 to 60 miles an hour, and it still took 10 minutes for them to get to you. <laughs> it's like, oh my God. And this was just a, a short break. It took us most of the day to walk that, um, it was, and it was just so hot. Is, it, is that the trail? That's the traditional route, yeah. And in fact, we had a hard time getting there because the housing had come up, had been built up so much, we had to walk through people's backyards to, to get to this road. Um, but they have since the trail's been moved off, the official route uh, stays into the hills. How much water did you, did you drink during these hot days? Um, you know, we tried to say um, 
you should carry three liters at least during the, in the day. Uh, and what we tried to do is when we got to a source, we would camel up. We'd just drink, 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 and then pack a little bit. The idea was not to pack that much. If it was eight to 10 miles to the next source, then you know, we'd carry very little water. But in the desert, that wasn't the case. So we would be carrying anywhere from three to four, five liters at a time. This is at the end of the desert. This is Kennedy Meadows. It's the beginning of the High Sierras. And you're going to see these familiar faces. Uh, gentleman on the right, is uh, his name was Dutchman. He's from the Netherlands. Fire Marshal from Vietnam. Myself, my wife, the young uh, lady in front, uh, Kosu. Um, and because most of us finished just about the same time. And that was a real big part of it is uh, it's the people that you meet along the trail. There's a, just a wonderful community. Um, and you make such great friends. Um, and it just makes the hike so much better and so much more enjoyable. Now, up to this point, I'm 700 miles into the trip. The next night is my first night that I spend alone. This will be the first time that, that nobody's around me. I leave and the rest of them stay. And so it took quite a while for that to happen. And there's the snow. That's what we're looking, looking to get to. That's the High Sierras. And this is me on top of Mount Whitney. Uh, Mount Whitney is a 16-mile uh, side trip off the trail. And uh, almost everybody does it. It's a great opportunity to get to the top of uh, the highest peak and the lowest 48. That's just gorgeous. Now at this point, I had to leave the trail for a week. I walked out at Lone Pine, got on a bus, so I'm two months in the wilderness, and then I, I'm thrown into the Greyhound Society. Um, so I traveled from uh, Lone Pine, California to Medford, Oregon. My daughter was graduating college, so I went to her graduation, spent a couple of days with the family, and then got a ride back up to where I left. And by that time, my hiking family was a week ahead of me. And so I was, that, I was kind of towards the end of the, of the pack, as you would call it. It's not really a pack. There's about two to 300 people a year who do this. And so I was towards the end of that, and I had to make new friends, which is no problem, uh, except there weren't a lot of people out there, and I spent a lot of time uh, on my own. When it, like I say, it took 700 miles to spend my first night alone, and I was worried I wasn't going to get this wilderness experience that I want, you know, me and the oneness of nature. And, and that old saying comes true, be careful what you wish for, because you may just get it. And I got it. I had a lot of time on my own after I got back. And this is uh, coming back down off Whitney. Uh, Guitar Lake is what this is called, and it's just off the Crest Trail. And... So I camped there the night before, then I climbed and summited Whitney and, and was coming back down. And you go out this valley and out you go. But uh, aptly named, I mean, it looks just like a guitar. Next day, highest point on the Pacific Crest Trail is right there, Forester Pass. So we've started the High Sierras and basically we've got nine major passes that we have to climb over, all above 10,000 feet. Forester Pass is 13,200 and some. So uh, officially, it's the highest point on the Pacific Crest Trail. And the idea with the passes is you wanted to get up in the morning while the snow was firm on the backside. And usually, because you're, you're coming from the south, there's not that much snow. But the minute you cross over, it's loaded. And you didn't want to be there when the snow was soft and you're post tolling and trying to get down off the uh, this pass. Um, one of the toughest days of the whole trip for me. Um, I was nervous, clouds were coming in. Um, there was snow on the south side. I'm all by myself, I'm at the highest point. Nobody else is around and, and it's my, the first major pass and so it was a very nervous day for me. You can see I've got my ice axe. Um, we were you know, instructed to bring those, suggested to bring them on this part of it. I never did use it because we had the hiking poles but um, and as soon as we could, we got rid of that and sent it home. Another couple lakes and then Sierras. 
And at this point, we were required to carry a bear canister to keep our food in, uh, to keep it away from the bears. And the idea is that you uh, set your tent up, you take your canister a couple hundred feet away from you, and let them play around with it if they want to. You spray paint it bright orange so you can find it the next day if they've moved it around. Um, and then also stop early, cook your dinner, and then go on a couple more miles before you camp. Don't camp where you cook. You're bringing that smell in. Uh, it took Northern California before I saw my first bear. I didn't see a single bear in Yosemite. Another lake. Uh, stream crossings. We had to do a number of stream crossings. A couple of them were um, um, listed as dangerous in the book. And you tried to time those so you did them in the morning again, so the snow is not the snow's not melting and the river's not rising. And so if you're doing it in the later afternoon, um, the river uh, levels increase and the swiftness increases. You undo your belt on your pack, you take your poles, you take your shoes off, and uh, you wade through it. And this is exactly where the mosquitoes know where to get you. <laughs> they know both of your hands are busy. There's nothing you can do about it. Um, this was the worst, and of course the bugs were just horrible in the Sierras. Um, I used 100% DEET. I had a, this guy here was using 35% DEET, and it wasn't cutting it. And I just, I went with full strength, and it was, you know, I would be fine, but they still were around you, just constantly around you. This is Banner Peak, Thousand Island Lake. It's the, supposedly the most photographed um, mountain in the High Sierras. Uh, we've done all but one pass, and we're getting, we'll do Donahue Pass in the morning, and then come down into Tuolumne Meadows. Tuolumne Meadows, beautiful meadow. We spent 4th of July here. And this is the transition between the High Sierras and um, the Sierras around Lake Tahoe. Uh, we're looking out towards Sonora Pass and Lake Tahoe. And the high mountains are all behind us now. Desolation Wilderness, beautiful shot. I don't know if you can see where the edge of the lake is, but it's right about there. The rest is reflection. Yep. That's all lake right there. Me being a hippie for a day, I uh, got my headband on and a patch of mule's ear all flowered out. Uh, we get to Lassen National Park and this is a, a poisonous lake that the trail goes by and warning signs all around. Make sure I haven't missed anything. Um, great sign. This is by Bernie Falls, Pacific Crest Trail. I can go 1,232 miles back. It's closer than if I finished. <laughs> so you're pretty close to halfway. And I didn't really, wasn't taking a picture of the sign, but there's a deer right there. <laughs> Just me on the trail. The sunset. Uh, Northern California. Uh, Marble Mountain Wilderness, um, real close to the Oregon border, and that was called the statue. An owl. See the owl? Uh, Crater Lake. So, I don't know if you're noticing the hair getting longer and the stomach getting smaller. Uh, that was the year of the Biscuit Fire, and uh, sh uh, Lake sh uh, or the Crater Lake was smoked in almost the whole time. In fact, we hiked, the, the guidebooks say, we're, we're gonna look at Mount Shasta for three weeks. We never saw Mount Shasta. Uh, this mountain is uh, Cowhorn, it's by Crescent Lake in Oregon. Um, it was a, a mountain that as kids we used to climb. We had friends that had a place at Crescent. See this thing in the back of my backpack? I'll tell you about that in just a minute, but I had it strapped on. There's the top of Calhorn, Crescent Lake in the background. Uh, some of you might recognize this, uh, Three Sisters Wilderness. It's a trail junction right there in the, in the valley. 
if you've been to the Three Sisters. Mount Jefferson, I'm getting close. Things look familiar. That was what I woke up to, Three Finger Jack. Yep, isn't that beautiful? Just uh, in Jefferson Park, uh, just a lake for lunch. Um, one of my old scout masters, Lloyd Osborne. I don't know if anybody knows Lloyd. Um, Lloyd uh, had hiked, section hiked the Pacific Crest Trail in Washington, Oregon. The only section he had left was from Timberline Lodge to um, Bridge of the Gods. And so Lloyd and I hooked up and we're going to do that together. We're going to spend three nights and get there. So this is right at the back of Timberline Lodge. Uh, the trail goes right behind the lodge. And there, I can't believe it, the Columbia River. Can you believe it? I'm almost home. <laughs> and a sign saying that Lloyd can still do it at 65. This is, um, you can, if you can see what they're putting in the ground there, this is um, by Mount Thielson on the Pacific Crest Trail. And some friends went camping at Diamond Lake. And in July, they put this sign right off the trail. And when I came through in um, early August, it was still there. I had no idea the sign was there. I'm walking down the trail. I see something that looks, looks out of place. And it's got my name on it. You know, everybody signed it. Good luck, pointing home. It was, uh, it was wonderful. And I just couldn't leave it out there. So I had to put it, I had to carry the damn thing for like 27 miles. I loved it, but I hated it. Uh, this is a group of hikers in um, Cascade Locks. And again, everybody had a trail name. There's Load, Sawbuck, Goof, Moonshadow. The date's wrong on the, the photo. This was the best day of the hike and the worst day of the hike. This is um, us as a group crossing uh, the Bridge of the Gods. There was probably uh, 30 hikers in town that day. And um, unbeknownst to me, which everybody else knew, and Ranger was there, and he knew, and they all were avoiding me. I didn't know what, like I had the plague, or I, I, we all stink. It can't be in my smell, <laughs> but nobody's paying attention to me. And, um, Rose had gotten uh, 75 family and friends on the other side of the bridge that I did not know that were there. And uh, they had to sign, and my dad and brother and mother and all the families there. And so that was a, the greatest day of the whole hike right there. And it was the worst day because they all went home. <laughs> and I got, as it says, I got 500 more miles to do. And it's at this point, it was, it was a, it was the hardest day for me to keep going. In fact, we, uh, uh, Rose and I went up to this little convenience store in Carson and sat down with some ice cream. And for two hours, she convinced me to keep going because I said, I can finish this next year. You know, I want to go home. I'm, I'm ready. I'm close. I, I, know, I know where I'm at. And I'll do it next year. And she said, you won't finish it. And uh, you need to keep going. So she convinced me and she was absolutely right. I needed to keep going. <laughs> um, Old Snowy, close to Sispas Pass, up in the Mount Hood, the uh, Goat Rocks area. I think, I'm not sure what that's called, Bear Paw or something. Bear, 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 bear. It's not bear grass, it's, it's the little fluffy thing. It only grows about a foot off the ground. What? An enemy? Yeah, Beautiful. Kind of, what is it? Yeah, it's, it's like a cotton ball there. Yeah, they're awesome. This is me, um, Packwood Glacier. Anybody, Goat Rock's been on the divide? You bet. Beautiful, huh? Um, the divide's right behind me. I slept in that rock hut that is all tore down now, and, and I put my tent up there. Um, this was a, the day before it was tough. My buddies were all ahead of me. And I hadn't seen him for a month. And I ran into a southbounder and he said, oh yeah, they're gonna camp up at this place. So I pushed myself and got up there and, and got reunited with everybody. And then the next day uh, I left town because we went to White Pass the next day and they stayed for an extra day. And so again, I was out alone all by myself. I love it when you can look at the bowl and you can see the trail ahead of you. I mean, it just is cool. Okay, this is uh, Wapit Lake. Um, we're out of uh, Stevens Pass, I believe. 
or Snoqualmie Pass, one of the, one of them. And I'm trying to mimic this picture. This is me as a Boy Scout. I thought I had the same spot, but I, the trail had been moved. But that's me um, on one of my 50 milers. And if you can see the heavy boots, the jeans, I got the ax on the pack. Um, you know, it's a lot different uh, uh, through hiking than it is section hiking. And the rest of us taking a siesta. Um, I'm by Indian Pass, Red Pass, and uh, Glacier Peak, and I don't know, the sound of music just took over. <laughs> You know, the, the deep valleys, the glaciated valleys in the background. Um, here's, you know, the Pacific Crest Trail um, was actually, a, there's some original trail, but a lot of it was just joining existing trails. Uh, the Cascade Crest Trail, the Skyline Trail in Oregon, the John Muir Trail in California, bringing all these trails together. And there's a spot there where the, there's still a Cascade Crest Trail sign. This, we're just about ready to get dumped on. And this is the next day when the sun shines, what it looks like, drying everything out. Stahican, we, uh, uh, you hike into High Bridge, there's a bus that'll come pick you up and it picks up at that spot two times a day. You wanna make sure you're there at one time or another because there's beer and pizza in Stahican. In a hot shower. And this is the bus they pick you in, pick you up in. And if you're a through hiker, they give you a felt pen and you write your name on the ceiling of the bus. I got my head in the way of the rainy pass sign. <laughs> Self portrait. We're in the North Cascades. And the North Cascades rivals the High Sierras. But much smaller, much more compact, much, you know, you can get through them so much quicker, but they are beautiful. Now, the trail, can you see the trail go right here? Yeah. yeah. Watch this shot. This is, this is how big this area is. That's us walking to that area. Last night on the hike, um, when you're out for five months, and just as had happened to me, we sold a business, got to figure out what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. I got five months to figure it out. I've come to this evening thinking, I haven't solved anything yet. <laughs> I've thought a lot about it, but I haven't come up with any solutions. And so uh, it's quick, it, you have to do some quick thinking. Uh, that's Lim Star. She's from New York City. She's done the Triple Crown. She's hiked the Appalachian, the Continental Divide and the Pacific Crest Trail and she, we keep in contact and she's um, uh, doing the long trail that goes across the, uh, the northern part of uh, Montana, Idaho and Washington. And this is on the last day. It looks like you could just fall off the mountain. This bird was about eight miles from the end. Um, it would not let you pass. Uh, I mean, I kid you not. Somebody's going to make chicken stew out of this bird because um, you had to you had to go up and over the trail. It would flutter. It would peck at you. What it kind did, of a bird is it? Well, it's a. Uh, I looked it up. I had a. It's not a uh, ptarmigan, but it's something. It, it was a little different. I can't remember what it was, but it was it was nasty. <laughs> Now, this is approaching the uh, border, and that is the border with Canada and Washington. And all across the country, there's a 20-foot swath. They've cut everything out, um, and you can see the uh, you can see the border. And that's us at the terminus of the trail. Uh, the Dutchman has the monument in his hands. You can lift it up, and people s put things in there. We were hoping there was some liquor in there, but uh, <laughs> if there was, it was already gone. Now, um, six of us finished this day. Uh, the Dutchman, Lemstar, Ranger with his pack still on, Fire Marshal, I'm taking the picture, and this gentleman closest, uh, Francisco, uh, he was hiking with me the last month because he wanted to date my daughter. 
And so he was getting to know me real well. Um, but the funny thing is, we didn't know it until some point in the hike, but Ranger and I started on the same day, and we hiked together that first day, but the rest of us all started on that very same day, but didn't know it, didn't see each other. And uh, we discovered that some point during the hike, and then it was real special that we all finished on the same day. And this is Manning Park. Um, our group, there's Don and Leslie, or they had finished it, these two folks right here. Uh, they weren't part of our group. And this guy right here is legendary. His name is Billy Goat. Billy Goat, at this point, was 55 years old. Um, he, doesn't look it, but um, he hikes every year from April to the end of September. He's done the Pacific Crest Trail four or five times. He's done the Continental Divide, the Appalachian. Um, he just walks all summer long. Uh, he's legendary on the trail. That's me with mom and dad. And I got back, a little shaggy looking, 45 pounds lighter. I lost, I lost most of my weight in the high Sierras. Uh, I don't do well at elevation, so I was nauseous most of the time. I found out very quickly I had to sleep below 10,000 feet or I couldn't sleep. Um, I didn't eat half the food I'd packed. In fact, uh, there was a gentleman that he and I were together through most of the high Sierras. He was running out of food, so I traded him, I don't know, it was like two dinners, three lunches, and a couple breakfasts for 13 squares of toilet paper. <laughs> And I, and I say, I, I just hate taking advantage of somebody like that, but I had to. Um, I, I had a fundraiser. Uh, you can go ahead and hit the lights if you want. I had a fundraiser with this. Um, I asked people to sponsor me per mile. Um, I had a great response. Uh, I raised over $8,000 and it was uh, all went to the Boy Scouts as uh, summer camp scholarships. So we helped a lot of kids get to summer camp. Um, I'll take some questions, but I, I got to share one quick joke, um, and it's how you can tell the difference between a weekend hiker, a section hiker, or a through hiker on the Pacific Crest Trail, because they're all sitting around the campfire having dinner one night, and the weekend hiker fly falls in his dinner, oh, and he just throws a fit, and he takes his pot and throws it all out, and you know goes to bed hungry. Section hiker, he's not quite that bad. He gets that fly and he scoops it out and he throws it out and finishes his dinner. Through hiker reaches in there, grabs a the fly behind the shoulders and says, spit it out, spit it out. <laughs> okay, Tom. We had two questions. One, you said it was five months and one day. Five months, one day. And so what day did you start? What day did you finish? I started April 25th. I finished uh, September 26th. What year? 2002. Two. The second question, did you ever have an injury or anything? Um, yes, I did. Um, just before Kennedy Meadows, where you start the High Sierras, um, I left, the guys were sleeping in, and I wanted to get an early start. So I took off, and it wasn't long on the trail, I saw bear, print, bear prints, fresh. And boy, the old hair on the back of your neck stands up. Um, but something happened to my foot on that day, and it was I could hardly walk on it. Um, I thought maybe a stress fracture or something, and I, and I gave it two days, and I did a lot of praying, and uh, I was able to continue, and I worked through it. Um, and it, it went away, the, the worst of it. My feet were always sore. There's, it took 10 minutes in the morning to get to where you could walk on your feet. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, to get done in five months, you had to average 20, 20 miles a day. And, but we had a lot of days off. You know, if we got to a town, uh, we might take a zero day where we, there's no hiking. And so um, you always look forward to those. My longest day was 34 miles. And a 20 mile day became something you look forward to. It's like, okay, it's a half a day. We can get to town by two o'clock and there's pizza, beer, and a shower. And so um, once you do that, uh, you know, after two weeks, it just becomes second nature. At two mile an hour pace, you're hiking for eight to 12 hours a day. I mean, you can just do the miles from that. 
So it, it's, uh, it just happens. It just happens. Do you have to get a bunch of like, special permits or something like that? You would. Normally you would because you cross through nine national parks, a whole bunch of national forests. But if you're doing more than 500 miles on the trail, um, the PCTA, the association, you can get a permit, a thru-hiker permit, and it covers every park. And we're that, uh, another rainy day we had was in the High Sierras. Um, I was on my own. It was about two days after Forrester Pass, and it just starts thunder and lightning and snowing. It's like, oh, what have I got myself into? And all of a sudden, this guy comes out of the woods, and, I, well, you know, I'll tag along with him as far as he's going. Well, he's a through hiker. So we ended up hiking most of the Sierras together. But that very same day, pouring down rain, snow, we meet a ranger coming in to establish her camp for the summer. And she wants to see our permits. You've got to be kidding me. It's raining. So we have to take our stuff off, open up, show her the permit, and away we went. <laughs> if you grew that beard this summer, would it be that same color? <laughs> If I if I'd lie and I'd say yes. <laughs> well, I think the gray in the middle spread out a little bit. If I did that again. <laughs> Brad, what, what did you eat? Um, you know, and that's a, that's a good question because, like I said, I started packing food in February, and my breakfasts were going to be pop tarts. I will never eat another pop tart again in my whole life. Um, you know, I threw coffee and uh, um, oatmeal, instant oatmeal in. I cooked breakfast one morning, and that was in Oregon. Um, you just didn't spend your time in the morning. You, you wanted to sleep until you had, you, you had to get up, and then you went. Uh, so I ate just along the way uh, Pop-Tarts, cookies in the morning. Lunch was, um, you'd be surprised how well cheese holds up in your backpack for several days. It might get a little runny, but you take your tortilla, put your cheese, your salami, spread some peanut butter, not together, you know, the other day's peanut butter. Peanut butter and jelly, peanut butter and honey. Um, so that was lunch. Um, and then dinners were anything from mac and cheese, Lipton noodles, uh, some freeze-dried. I will never eat another um, chicken freeze-dried dinner. It just, there's some things that just don't taste good anymore, even, even this long. Uh, I don't know the numbers. Our year, um, it was about 30%. And most of them are young kids, uh, either graduated high school or graduated college. You know, they're going to do a couple things before they settle down. Um, those groups were hard to hang around. It was nice to have some people your own age because we kind of did the same things. But you'd get to town and, um, you know, all kinds of things would go on. But I mean, it, it was, there was probably 30 people that I would hike with. And, you know, you'd see them at some point during the week, either on the trail or in town. And they were either just leaving as you get there or you're leaving as they come up. And um, there's log books all along the way at either post offices or um, anybody been to um, Olali Lake in Oregon? The store, the trail comes right through there. The store has a, a register. So you can keep up with who's ahead of you, what's going on. There's a real communication on the trail up and down with those books and then other people. Did you stop at Ashland? Because uh, we were staying in a hospital in Ashland one time to see the play, and there's a whole bunch of hikers that happened to be taking the day off there. And they were talking, they were having lots of trouble with uh, poison ivy just getting from the trail to Ashland. Mm -hmm. And apparently there was just a huge amount and they were all itching and covered with it. And they also, what impressed me, a lot of them were from Portland. And uh, they, they were light, they had very light packs. I was amazed at how lightweight uh, they had it all figured out. The gear, the gear, and you know, another 10 years later, it's even got that much lighter and better. Mm -hmm. Um, it, I mean, you can get your, your, just your pack weight down to less than a pound. Uh, they have straps that you put your dirty socks in the straps. That's the padding. Um, I mean, they think of all kinds of things. Ashland is a major stop for through hikers. Um, one reason is you spend three months in California, and it, it's just a line. It's just a, a line in the sand, but you got just to get out of California into another state. 
into something different. And so that's Ashland's a big kickoff place. Um, and they were going to do a play. They were oh yeah, yeah. And you know, and somebody had mentioned Trail Angels with the water caches. There are people all up and down the trail that will come and get you and take you places. Uh, there's one place in Agua Dulce, California. Um, they they can house probably 30 hikers at a time. She washes your clothes. You can't use her washer. Um, they, give, they have a car that's just for through hikers. Um, the tremendous amount of support. Um, and you really couldn't do it without them, uh, that kind of help. Um, and we, so we call those trail angels. And anything that happens decent on the trail, we call trail magic. Um, and something have you come across cold soda in the creek, you know. That's trail magic. Something, something cool is happening. Um, but you, I don't know if you mentioned, did you get close to those hikers? <laughs> really close to them? <laughs> okay, yeah. It is. But you know, my point is, we'd get to where we'd get to a hotel room and we'd have to leave our shoes and backpacks on the outside. I mean, everything stunk so bad. It was, it was horrible. Yes, ma'am. following and he would bring stuff to her and her girlfriends that were doing the drug. Mm -hmm. and, and uh, it was really interesting to talk about. Well, it's a lot of logistics and I would never do that again because I put her alone on some logging roads and, and dirt roads. Yeah. I mean, I had to hike 25, 30 miles to the next point she picked me up. she have to drive back out, mm -hmm. come up the highway, come back in. She'd spend all day driving. Yeah. You know, just to get to the, the connections. And uh, it just wasn't a safe thing to do. Yeah. Yes, sir. Did you use a GPS system to track the trail that you were on? Uh, just maps. Just um, maps. GPS wasn't around at that time. There was, the smartphones weren't there. The, the neatest thing that uh, some of the kids had was they could, when they got to town, they could hook their um, whatever they had to a phone and it would just download all the all their uh, typings and you know, all the texting that they've done on the trail but now um, there's an app for your smartphone it's got every map every location shows you right where you're at what's next um, it's really kind of cool what they've done how did you uh, purify your water i, you did. I did um i used uh iodine and i didn't have a, a you know, save me a pound. Um, and I, you know, I didn't think the iodine was going to hurt me that much. Um, but the problem I had with iodine is you have to let it wait for 30 minutes. So that cameling up doesn't really work when you use iodine. You have to pack more of it. Um, so I would always hang by a guy that had a pump, you know, so we use his water and then uh, I'd take my iodine. So you didn't boil your water? No. Uh, uh, again, you know, the fuel you'd use to do that, way too much. Um, and does anybody use iodine? And you know how to get rid of the taste. Yeah, and the cheapest one's just vitamin C. Just chew up a little chunk of vitamin C, throw it in, the color and the taste goes away. It's really cool. Yes, sir. No, it's not. I figured five months I'd be okay, and I was taking a chance. Um, yeah, yes, ma'am. Cheryl Strait's Wild. Wild. Uh, no, I haven't. I heard it's great. Yeah. Um, after, after our year, there, there were a number of people um, really started to do things. And there's a, a couple documentaries that are out. There's a lot of short films that people have put together along the trail. Um, in fact, um, the last weekend of April is the kickoff. They actually have a kickoff, and it's... Uh, the annual zero-day PCT kickoff in uh, Lake Marino, which is 20 miles from the border. And there'll be 600 people there now. When I went down for the kickoff, there were 50 or 60 of us. Now there's over 600, and the vendors come in. The Postal Service comes in and, and mails packages for you. It's this huge deal uh, to help and support these people as they, as they start their hike. Um, what was the question? <laughs> book yes and so um, and now uh, they have these short stories or short videos that they'll show all weekend 
that people from the years prior have done. And um, some really good ones, uh, guys, he did three years in a row. There's walk, um, still walking, and more walking. And uh, you can get them, you can find that on the link at the PCTA.org, the Association for the Pacific Crest Trail. A lot of good stuff. But yeah, the book is uh, supposed to be really good. Yeah. Do your feet still hurt? <laughs> no, it, it took a couple years that I didn't think about it. It took, it took a long time. It's, uh, you know, it was just sore. They were just sore. It's a lot of miles. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate talking about my hike. Thank you.